so I'll be talking to you today about sea dragons, so uh, the history and biology of ichthyosaurs from the UK. So my title slide is um, a really lovely view of uh, Kimmeridge Bay in the UK, it's on the southwest coast of Dorset. And this is where one of the ichthyosaurs um, I'll later be talking about was found. It's just a very, very beautiful bit of coastline that I thought I'd share with you all. So I'll start talking about what are ichthyosaurs, uh, what makes an ichthyosaur, and then I'll go into its biology, um, clues from what the fossils we've seen, and then I'll start talking about some of my recent research. So ichthyosaurs are a type of marine reptile. They're not a dinosaur and they're not uh, a whale. And the name actually means fish lizard. They evolved uh, from a group of unidentified um, land-dwelling reptiles that return to the sea, much in the same way as we see in like whales and dolphins today, uh, seals, things like that. And they were placed in a group called diapsids, um, which you can see here on the family tree. This just means that they have uh, two openings in the skull that we can see here. So this here at the top right is the skull of a Triassic ichthyosaur um, called Thalatoarchon. And these at the bottom, this is a Varanid lizard. Um, this is a, an extinct form. They're sort of very similar to monitor lizards. And this is a T-Rex. And you, here you can see the, the similarities between the two. You've got these two openings at the bottom of the skull, which are called super temporal fenestra. And then here we have the orbits. Um, so the ichthyosaurs are actually, they're more closely related to like lizards and snakes than they are dinosaurs, pterosaurs and crocodiles which uh, you can see in their anatomy. So we'll move on. So they first appeared in the Triassic. Um, as I said before, we don't actually have any fossil material of the animals they evolved from. The first ichthyosaurs to appear looked very lizard-like, as we can see in this one here. And in the Triassic, they were super abundant. So this is quite um, it's sort of a very daunting diagram, but you don't want to worry about any of the names. We just want to look at how all these black lines here represent an occurrence of a taxa. So you can see in the Triassic at the bottom, ichthyosaurs are really, really diverse. And if you think some of these lines are actually only representing genuses and not species, do you think that their diversity is going to be even higher? And at the time, they were like apex predators in the Triassic. And then as we go into the Jurassic, at about 200 million years old uh, ago, they the diversity declines a bit. They were replaced. Um, by pliosaurs as the top predators, so you have a fewer number of taxa around. And as we go into the Cretaceous, their diversity drops even more. And they actually um, went extinct at about 94 million years ago. This is uh, about 30 million years before the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs. And it's thought that um, this was a two-phased extinction. So it, the Beginning of the Cenomanian, which you can see here, we had a, um, you had a, uh, just a, the disappearance of soft prey and generalist predators, and only leaving the apex predators, um, specifically Palateopterygias. And then in the second event, it, the Cenomanian Turanian boundary, which is right at the top of the screen here, um, we had an anoxic event. So um, there was a a lot less oxygen in the waters in the oceans. And this was a big um, extinction anyway, but it eventually did actually, it took out all the ichthyosaurs. Um, we, there's only a handful of occurrences over this boundary, but they disappear soon after this event. But you can see, looking at these body plans, how the ichthyosaurs change from a very lizard-like animal through to something that represents a dolphin or a shark. So we have this evolution of adaptations to a completely aquatic uh, lifestyle. So you can see here that the, the big resemblance of ichthyosaurs to sort of dolphins, whales, you've got a dorsal fin. And we know your ichthyosaurs have dorsal fins because they're actually, um, the soft tissues of these are actually preserved in fossils from Germany, spe specifically the Posidonia schifa. And we can see the nice big fluke on the tail as well. There's something really interesting that happened to ichthyosaurs. If you look on the diagram on the right, is how they modified their forelimbs to become flippers. So <clears throat> this is a very early, what we think ichthyosaurs may have evolved from. 
So you can see this hand is very similar to our hand, but over the course of their evolution, they reduced their humerus, which is your like upper arm bone. They reduced it to a very short, stumpy, robust bone. Their ulnar and radius, which is our lower arm, they reduce completely as well to just these very round elements. And all the hand bones got reduced as well. And they actually developed the ability to um, create additional digits and phalanges. So they could actually make these super long and very, very broad flippers, um, which is ideal for going through the water. And the cetaceans actually did something extremely similar as well. And also something ichthyosaurs did, which is very similar to cetaceans, is they reduced their pelvic girdle completely. So it's just two isolated elements that sort of float in the hip region. And their forelimb um, is is, follows the same sort of plan as their uh, forelimb here with these uh, sort of extended phalanges and broad. But they're actually reduced in size. Some of, some of these fall, uh, hind limbs are really, really, really small. And going into the size, so ichthyosaurs actually did reach some amazing sizes, and this was mainly when they first appeared in the Jurassic. So you have Shetasaurus, and this thing in the middle, this, um, they actually found one that was about 21 meters long, which is huge. But by the Jurassic, you didn't get things that really got that big. There's a handful of things that could uh, sort of, that may have got up to a similar length, but most of the ichthyosaurs we see in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous are normally about two to five meters long. Um, something similar to Platopterygius here and um, Uranosaurus here. So they're sort of very, they're sort of medium size. They're sort of the equivalent, they'll be about the size of a bottlenose dolphin. So what also makes them unique and things we only see in ichthyosaurs are um, something to do with their vertebrae. So their vertebrae are the same throughout the entire spinal column. They all look like this figure on the left. They're very plate-like, they're sort of dished. This is what they call um, amphi amphicelous vertebrae. So it's concave on each side of the vertebrae. And this is the same for every vertebrae down the entire spinal column. And this is very unique to ichthyosaurs. So in dinosaurs, you have complete variation all the way down the neck. You have a ball and socket joint. And then you, it's flat faces, um, whereas this is, it's very characteristic of uh, uh, ichthyosaurs, but fish also have the same um, uh, type of vertebrae. But they also don't fuse their neural arches to the vertebrae. So something we do with reptiles to see how old they are is if they fuse the neural arch to the vertebrae, how much fusion there is. Um, the amount of fusion in the skull bones. But something unique to ichthyosaurs is they do not fuse any bones in their skull, in their body at all, which makes um, aging these things extremely, extremely difficult. Um, they also, you have these little brown things on the vertebrae, on the centrums. These are where the ribs attach. So this is another unique thing that in, in ichthyosaurs, the ribs will only attach to the centrum. They will not attach to the neural arch, which is seen in uh, most other reptiles and mammals. Um, a lot of dinosaurs have their rib at uh, attachment up here on the neural arch. But something really, really odd with ichthyosaurs is they don't actually have tooth sockets. What they have is this really deep groove either side of their jaw with the teeth just slot in place. So most lizards, their teeth are actually fused to the jaw, so you don't have tooth sockets. In all the dinosaurs, you have like, everything else has big tooth sockets, whereas ichthyosaurs just have this big, long uh, groove. So moving on. So what, what one thing that makes ichthyosaurs really weird is they're known for enormous eyes. They actually have the largest eyes compared to the, their body ratio of any vertebrate known. So in these eye sockets, you can see they have a sclerotic ring. So these are actually made of individual plates. These aren't flat plates. They're slightly curved and they're extremely rigid. They're actually, they're, they're ossified, they're bone. So this would have held the eye in place. And it's thought that if you saw were, um, would have been extremely streamlined. So it's possible that they, 
their eyes were designed in the same way as fish eyes, so they're flattened on the side to help with streamlining. So if you're an apex predator, you don't want to be looking like this goldfish here with your eyes sticking out. That's not going to help you if you're swimming through the water, um, trying to be as streamlined as possible. Um, you're going to be wanting something like this mullet here. But the infosaurs, uh, the fossil evidence we find is actually really, really cool because it's giving us insights into how these ichthyosaurs lived and the adaptations to their aquatic lifestyle. So we know that ichthyosaurs were air breathing because they have nostrils in the skull. And we know they bore live young because we've actually found the fossils that have the babies inside them. Um, so this here is, uh, you can see the baby is coming out of the birth canal here. But you can also see all these tiny vertebrae within the rib cavity. And this is other juvenile ichthyosaur, baby ichthyosaurs still within the mother. And the same one here. And it's thought that ichthyosaurs were probably um, ovovivapious, which means um, the embryo actually develops inside an egg within the mother. But the egg then is retained within the mother until it's ready to hatch. So they're not actually... Um, laying eggs, they're retaining them within inside the body. And this is the same, you can see this in sort of many sharks, rays and snakes today. Um, some sharks will lay eggs, but some sharks will retain that in the mother and then they'll just, they're, the eggs will hatch and they'll, uh, they'll birth live young. And some really, really cool um, specimens have a lot of soft tissues preserved. But this one from the Posidonia Schiefer, it's a specimen of Stenopterygius. It's early Cretaceous ichthyosaur. It actually has the red blood cells preserved in the soft tissues, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, so these red blood cells are incredibly small. So you can see that's one micron, which is it, it's super, super tiny. These are scanning electron uh, microscope images. So you need a really, really high powered microfication to see these things. But these are really, really small, which has led to the hypothesis that would, this would have um, allowed for greater oxygen deficiency, diffusing capacity. So they could have uh, led a very high energy lifestyle, such as a, a pursuit predator. And they've actually done um, carbon-13 compositions on ichthyosaurs, which show the ichthyosaurs are very, very high up in the food chain. Um, and these ichthyosaurs, so you've got, uh, got the oxygen diffusion capacity with these red blood cells and there's been studies that looked into the deep diving capabilities of ichthyosaurs and it's thought that ophthalmosaurus as of a conservative estimate could have dived up to about 600 meters deep and these large eyes that we saw in the previous slide these eyes would have allowed for um really really good vision um at depths or in low light conditions or just for being if you're a fast active predator you'll be able to see your prey something else really cool with the soft tissues this was a recent paper that came out i think last year or the year before um this is uh stenopterygius again from germany but these soft tissues actually show a layer of blubber under the skin so here we've got the blubber this black stuff uh on the top and this is the skin on top of that and this is very similar so this is uh whale blubber you see the skin here and the thick layer of blubber here. And this blubber actually provides very strong evidence that ichthyosaurs were warm blooded, um, which is really cool because most reptiles, uh, lizards are cold blooded. And another thing with these soft tissues that we're finding is actually the color is preserved in the skin. So in one, in this Stenopterygis study, it was found that the skin had counter shading so it would have looked like very much like a shark. You've got the dark on top and the light on the bottom. And there was also someone found um, color in a ichthyosaur from Lyme Regis in the UK, and that was dark all over. And this sort of correlates to many marine um, mammals alive today. So you, you got sharks; they're counter shaded. They probably they live in the surface waters or sort of shallow waters. They're active hunters. Whereas sperm whales, which are really they're deep diving animals, are uniform all over because they're they're going down to depths where there's no light, so they don't have to worry about not being seen. So I'm just going to run through the history of ichthyosaurs. 
Um, and just some of the record, first recorded remains and how they came about in the literature and how we know them today. So the first ever um, illustration of an ichthyosaur was in uh, 1699, Edward Ludd. And he, he illustrated the first ichthyosaur remains but described them as fish. Uh, a few years later, Jacob Schnauzer, I think, described two ichthyosaur vertebrae, but he identified them as a man lost at sea, which um, is a little bit concerning, looking at the how, the, how our vertebrae are completely different ichthyosaurs, but they didn't know what ichthyosaurs were at the time, so we'll uh, give him the benefit of the doubt. In 1766, we started, ichthyosaur jaws were starting to be found near Bath, but they were labeled as crocodiles. Um, 1779, uh, John Walcott illustrated an ichthyosaur in his book, but he described them as uh, figures of petrifications. Um, but by this point, uh, a lot of um, 18th century uh, collections were acquired by museums, and they contained dozens and dozens of ichthyosaur bones. But they had it at that point all been labelled as fish, dolphins, crocodiles, and teeth belonging to sea lions. In 1804, Edward Donovan at St Donuts in South Wales found a four metre long ichthyosaur. And this was considered to be a giant lizard, which is not necessarily wrong, but they hadn't gotten on to the idea of what these things actually were at this point. Then a news article in Bath reported two skeletons being found. Um, but it wasn't clear, and they were described as being a crocodile. But it wasn't until 1811 where Joseph Anning found the first complete pterosaur skull, which is pictured here. And then 1812, Mary Anning found the torso here. So Mary Anning is an extremely famous paleontologist that I'll talk a bit about in a minute. But this is the first ichthyosaur um, skeleton to be actually identified as ichthyosaur. And it was um, described as Temnodontosaurus um, in four, it is now described as Temnodontosaurus, but it was originally described as Ichthyosaurus or Fish Saurian. Um, so, so Mary Annie, she's really, really awesome. I'm going to talk about this lady. So she grew up in Lyme Regis on the south coast of England um, in the early 1800s. And by the age of 12, um, in 1812, she actually found the first ichthyosaur skeleton ever to be identified as ichthyosaur. Over her life, she actually found many science, uh, important fossils uh, and many of the first of its kind, uh, especially like this uh, plesiosaur here on the right. Then this is actually one of her sketches in a notebook that was uh, put in a letter to send to someone to, describing her discovery. So this just sort of shows that she was a very, very competent woman. She knew what she was looking at. She knew these things were new and important. And she started working with paleontologists at the time, like Richard Owen and William Buckland, to get these things out there. Um, another thing she found, there was these things called bizarre stones. Um, they were weird stones that were being found with these remains and isolated. And she actually... Fat, like she came to the conclusion that these things were coprolites, or in other words, fossil poo. Um, so she's a very, very incredible woman, but unfortunately she didn't get any credit for her work at the time. And as my other love is pterosaurs, I'll also mention this find that she, uh, she found in 1828, while she was in her late 20s. So this jumble of bones here doesn't look like much, but it's actually the first known pterosaur outside of Germany. And it was the first, it was at the time, the largest ever pterosaur found. Um, it was first described by William Buckland as Pterodactylus ma uh, macrox. Everything, any territory at the time was called Pterodactylus. That was the genus found in Germany. And this was later reclassified as Dimorphodon. And this thing's really cool. It's got a short, stumpy little snout, full of teeth and a really, really long tail. This is just a very, very primitive pterosaur and it's just a super important specimen. And this is a very uh, famous piece of artwork, Dura Antica by Henry de la Beck. Um, and this, is, this artwork is largely based off all the fossils that Mary Anning found. So you had the dimorphodons up here, crocodiles, turtles, 
these eosaurs and these things here are the early depictions of what ichthyosaurs may look like. I just think it's a very wonderful picture. Um, and this here as well, this is uh, another picture of an ichthyosaur I just really love. It's from 1863, from Louis Figures, The World Before the Divulge. And I just love how the ichthyosaur here is just spouting water out of its nostrils. Um, we really don't think it did this, but they would have uh, looked at these specimens and seen the similarities between these and dolphins and whales. And they would have seen that dolphins and whales obviously spurt water out of their blowholes. And they might probably assume that ichthyosaurs did the same thing. But I just think it's a very, very lovely uh, depiction of an ichthyosaur. And by the 18th, in the 19th century, ichthyosaurs became really popular. You had the um, discovery of dinosaurs. Um, and the best example of this is the Crystal Palace dinosaurs and uh, marine reptiles. So this is the Crystal Palace ichthyosaur. So Crystal Palace is down in London in the UK. And these are huge concrete ichthys uh, animals that were commissioned in 1852 under the direction of Sir Richard Owen. Um, the ichthyosaurs were placed in pools that were affected by the tides. So you had the rising of waters to make them look like they were submerged for a bit of realism. They were actually, as you can see, they look like they're slumped back on the shore, sort of basking in the sun. And this is how they, they, they believe they behaved a bit like, you know, seals or crocodiles. They could pull themselves up on land. Um, but it's it's been proven that they, they just wouldn't be able to do this. They were completely aquatic. So I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Steve Etches. So a lot of paleontology has relied on fossils found by amateur collectors who've just devoted their time to walking up and down the beaches, finding these fossils and preparing, preparing them much like Mary Anning back in the 1800s. And Steve is an excellent example about why these guys are just so valuable to science. Steve has collected from the Kimmeridge clay, which is on the south coast of Dorset in the UK, for over 30 years, and he has amassed a huge collection from everything from fish, barnacles, echinoids, ammonites, ichthyosaurs, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and most of them are actually new to science. As you can see here, we've got some dinosaur limb bones on his table, some it slabs with ichthyosaurs in the back, some fish. It's a really, really impressive collection. And in 2016, they actually got a national lottery funding to build a museum for Steve to put his collection in. It's called the Etches Collection, the Museum of Jurassic Marine Life. And it's, it's an amazing, amazing museum. If you ever get the chance to visit there, I suggest you go. Um, it's in Kimmeridge in the UK. Um, so while I was looking for an, a master's project, I'd gone down to the museum, we'd gone along the beach, and I, I said, see, I'm looking for a project. And naturally, uh, being paleontologist, we headed to the local pub for some uh, a pint and uh, some beer. And he offered me an ichthyosaur to work on. And I believe he described it as a pretty nice specimen. And I agreed and we went back to have a look at it. So a bit about the Kimmeridge clay before I talk about the ichthyosaur. So as you can see here in the blue, this is the outcrop of the Kimmeridge clay. So we've got a few miles of outcrop along the coastline. And it actually stretches all the way from Dorset across um, England up into Yorkshire. And it represents uh, the big seaway back in the Jurassic that used to cover the, uh, the UK. And it yields an extraordinarily wide diversity of fossil faunas. So my ichthyosaur that I was working on came from the White Stone Band. It's called the White Stone Band ichthyosaur. And most of the Kimmeridge clay is mainly black shales, oil shales, uh, mudstones. So you can see it's very, very dark, shaly, crumbly. But the white stone band is a single horizon at the top of the Kimmeridge clay. And it's a coccolith limestone. Um, oh, yeah. You can see here, this is my dad for acting as a scale. And this is the white stone band where it hits the beach. And it is a laminated coccolith limestone. So you've got layers and layers of like a coccolith ooze. So this would have been, if you had a big storm, you had an increase of upwelling in nutrient-rich waters. Um, 
it's caused big, big algal blooms. And something you can see something similar in the Red Sea today. So you have these beds with this big algal bloom, and then over the top would have been microbial mats holding it all together. You get this laminated structure here. And this here is an SEM image, a scanning electron microscope. I think this uh, scale bar is about 10 microns. And these are whole coccoliths. You can see they're still articulated. So they're just a type of plankton. And they're made of individual little plates and they form a ball when they're uh, all together. And this is my it, the Ipiosaurine question. I hope you all agree that it's an extremely beautiful specimen. And I think that Steve has done an amazing job preparing this and putting the slabs back together so it can be worked on. So I made a diagram. So this is what the ichthyosaur possibly probably looked like um, when it was alive. So you've got this, the whole skeleton. Um, I used previous studies to uh, make this diagram. So all the bones in gray are the bones that we, um, Steve had collected off the beach. The bones in white are the bones that we unfortunately do not have. It would have been a very stumpy ichthyosaur. It had a really big, deep rib cavity, uh, tiny, sort of very small forelimbs in comparison with the rest of the body, and a huge, huge eye and a mouth full of hundreds and hundreds of teeth. So part of describing animal, you have to look for it very, very closely. And we started with the skull, which is beautifully preserved. You can see every bone suture. It's, it's really, really gorgeous. Um, but one thing I'm just going to note on the skull is on this bone here, the supertemporal bone, you can see there's like, an, uh, like a nub in a, a process coming off the top, which you can see here, it's magnified. And this is really, really bizarre. And it's got this weird rugose texture on the end. And I've seen in some, in some specimens, they have a little bump here, but nothing's as prominent and nothing with this texture on. And we think it's probably uh, like a big muscle attachment or a big attachment site for cartilage. So this thing had a really, really strong, powerful body when its head was sort of almost like held rigid in front. And something also weird about this animal <clears throat> is the teeth. So if you saw teeth are normally really quite robust, they're chunky, and they have big, thick striations on the enamel and the crown. Whereas these teeth, as you can see, they're really tiny. So this is a one centimeter scale here. And these um, teeth are just under a centimeter. They're really tiny. And they're also, the enamel is also completely smooth, uh, which is really, really bizarre for it. And there's, a, I counted 50 teeth in the upper two through. So that's about 200 teeth in the whole mouth of the Scythiosaur. And that is a lot of teeth. And we think about the number of teeth, the smooth enamel, how they're shaped, they're very slender, they're tiny. I think this thing is gonna be eating some soft prey, something like squids or small fish. It's certainly not gonna be an apex predator going around eating other Ichthyosaurs. The teeth just aren't designed um, for that sort of diet. What we do to see how animals relate to other animals in paleontology, we do a thing called a phylogenetic analysis. And you see this a lot in paleontology. You'll see, oh, it's, a, it's related to T-Rex, it's related to this. And this is how we know how, what it's related to. So essentially, we just get um, all the different characteristics of this animal, all the characteristics of all the other animals that we know. We run it in some software, and essentially it produces a family tree. Our analysis shows that this animal, which we call Philosodraco etchesi, which actually means uh, etches sea dragon, this is named after Steve, um, it comes out in a family called Nanoopterygiae. This is a bizarre little animal called Nanoopterygius, um, which I'm going to talk about further in a minute. Um, but these uh, animals, they're quite small animals, they have small flippers. Um, but it's also closely related to Ophthalmosaurus, which is the sort of dominant ichthyosaur um, in the early Jurassic in the UK. So one thing I think is cool about this ichthyosaur is the taphonomy, where it's found in the white stone band, and we've got the front half of the skeleton articulated, there was something going on here. So what I think is that the ichthyosaur would have nosedived into the sediment at an angle, so the sediment itself would have been sort of an oozy sediment with layers held together by a microbial mat. 
So as this thistle went down, it would have hit a layer which was a lot harder than the rest above, which caused it to sort of scooch along and fall onto its side. And then the front half got buried and remained articulated. And then the back half would have been exposed to currents and scavengers um, and disarticulated. So we have, we do have some other blocks of this ichthyosaur, which are just sort of like vertebrae and ribs scattered across. So we can assume that this is uh, safely what this has happened. And this just means that the front half was buried in the mud, it was protected, and it actually led to some really, really awesome uh, preservation of the front half. So what we're seeing here is um, on, in, on A and B, um, these little white things that are over the neural arches, um, these we think are actually ossified ligaments. So this is an SEM picture. So this is under the scanning electron microscope. I managed to convince Steve to ping off a tiny bit of his very precious ichthyosaur to SEM. And we can see these ligaments here coming in. And these essentially have been phosphatized. So we can't see uh, cell structure or anything like that, but you can definitely see ligaments running all the way along the backbone. And they're actually present on some of the uh, ribs as well. So this thing would have had huge ligaments running all the way down its back. And also something very noticeable, you see in the rib cage here is all this black stuff, whereas the rest of the stuff uh, matrix is white. And this is a close up of this black material. So what we think this black material is, is actually like uh, decayed organs which is really, really exciting. Um, I haven't seen anything like this really preserved from the Kimridge clay. Um, um, we can't really distinguish between different organs because what would have happened is it was all trapped in the body cavity and it would have certainly turned into like a nice smelly organ soup. Everything would have de just decayed, but it was trapped in under the sediment so it couldn't go anywhere or be eaten by scavengers. So we have this... Uh, preserved in there and it's just it's just awesome awesome preservation so to fi finish up so this is just some other work i've been doing on the very bizarre little it you saw i talked about earlier called nanoopterygius this is but this is he was the most rare rarest it you saw ever in the uk from the kimridge clay there was only one specimen known of this animal and it was high up here on the Side the wall in the Natural History Museum of London, and it it's bizarre in the fact that its four its flippers are tiny compared to the rest of its body. So much so when the first, when the specimen was found, people had thought that it had been faked, like the the forelimb had been glued on there. They didn't think it could come from the same animal. Uh, <clears throat> so I teamed up with a Russian colleague called Nikolay. And he went, he visited the NHM and this specimen is right at the top of the wall. Um, it hasn't been taken down, it's completely inaccessible. Um, but what he did um, was he put a camera on the top of a fishing rod uh, to be able to get photos of this specimen uh, before the museum opened, um, which is just, I think, an amazing idea. So this was the photograph he got. It may not look like much, but it's actually a really, really big improvement on um, what we'd known before with this animal. And he managed to get a lot of close-ups as well, which is really, really helpful. So no one, because this, uh, if you saw, was so inaccessible, no one had looked at it. No one had identified other specimens of this thing. But what we did was once we'd got the photographs of this um, this one, we could actually compare it with all the ichthyosaurs we saw in Europe, in Russia, Arctic, and in the UK. We actually managed to identify several new spe species and a lot of new specimens of this ichthyosaur, um, some in the uh, actually in the Etches collection as well, which is just really, really exciting. So we've gone from only one specimen of this animal restricted to the UK to finding out that it was really, really widespread. And we know almost every skeletal detail of this animal now. Um, and it, all it needed was a fishing rod, um, which I think is a little bit ironic. But I'd like to say thank you for listening. And if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Okay, Ms. Jacobs, we do have some questions here in the chat and the Q&A, so we'll go ahead and get some of those to you. Uh, so, are ichthyosaurs related to anything living today? 
No. So unfortunately, when it pistols died out, um, they died out. They went extinct. Um, the closest thing alive today is going to be lizards or snakes. Um, they went out the same with the dinosaurs, so I'm afraid. Okay, so uh, can you talk about how this animal would have moved out with swimming? Were the flippers used for steering and the tail was used pretty much for propulsion? How would that have worked? Do we know? Yeah, so we think um, the, the forelimbs would have been quite mobile. And there are actually species of dolphin that really do use their the flippers for moving along and they can... Uh, they can sort of turn and they use them to swim. So we think it's probably quite plausible they use their flippers for guiding along, but for um, for faster speeds, they just need one flick of their tail and they could zoom off a bit like, their, their tail's the same as sharks today. And you see what, if a great white does one flick of the tail, it's gone. So um, probably a bit of both. They would probably move slowly or direct the, do the direction with the flippers and then for speed, they use their tail. We had another question here. Uh, can you talk about some of the tools that would have been used in processing this specimen? So in actual uh, physical preparation of the animal. So I think um, for this, for the white stone band one, Steve uses um, air pens and he uses air abrasives to prepare the specimen. The specimen was found in um, different blocks on the beach. So he, he also put all the blocks back together, glued them, and I think he put like a, um, a like something on the back to hold keep all the blocks together. But it was just manual preparation with an air pen and an air abrasive, and many hours of spare time. I think. Okay, and thanks everyone for all your questions. We've got just a huge number of questions stacked up, so we will get to as many as we can in the yeah. time that we have. Uh, so. Can you tell us, do we have any idea about how long these ichthyosaurs would have lived? I don't. So because we can't tell the age from the bone, it's very, very difficult to actually get an age of these things. We can tell if it's a juvenile by the size, an adult by the size, but we can't put a number on, on it. There might have been some studies where they looked at sort of like bone histology, um, but I really can put a number on it. They would have probably had quite quite long lifespans, probably, I would say 20, 30, 40 years. Um, but it's very hard to put a number on something like that. So. Sorry, is there any indication Sorry. of what would have killed this particular specimen? No, um, there is not a single mark on any of the bones. Um, there's no bite marks, uh, but we don't have the back half of the animal. So something might have happened to the back half but animals do just die, um, died of old age, maybe, with those ossified ligaments on its back. Um, and the Kimmeridge Clay Sea was very deep. And there's been a lot of studies looking at the ichthyosaurs in Germany and how all the, di all the different ways they've dived into the sediment, uh, how they've been preserved. And it is quite common because the head is a lot heavier. It acts as sort of like a spear into the mud, and then you get the flopping over. Um, but yeah, there's no bite marks. There's nothing like that on the animal. Okay. Uh, but is that something that you would commonly see in other specimens? Uh, we commonly see bite marks. After yeah. Um, in, I know in the etches collection, there is quite a few specimens that do actually have bite marks and things on them. There's bones with big bites on them and stuff. But it's very hard to say whether that bite mark killed the animal or whether it was done after it died. Um, you can just say there was bite marks on there, but you've got huge predators in the, in the seas there. If there was a dead animal floating past, everything would have had a munch on it. So it's very hard to say what killed it and what was just having a munch, or say. Okay, so can you talk about the uh, ichthyosaur's eyes a little bit more again, please? Yeah, so um, the eyes itself, so the they have sclerotic rings in the eyes. So this was, would have created a very rigid structure. They wouldn't have been able to move their eyes as much. They would have been quite uh, motionless, if that makes sense. They, could, they wouldn't have the same range of vision as we do. Um, but the structure of the eye, so our eye, we have eyeballs, we have big round eyes, but the ichthyosaur eye uh, orbits are not uh, like round. We, they, don't, they wouldn't have had a big circle sticking out the front of their eye. 
And fish eyes are the internal structure is designed in a certain way where the outer bit can be very flat to aid in streamlining. And we think that that's how ichthyosaurs might have eyes might have worked. They could have had some adaptations in the back, so they could have a, a, a flatter eye to aid in streamlining. But no one's found a ichthyosaur eye preserved yet, so um, we won't know until the uh, impossible happens. So. Okay, so uh, do we have any estimates as to how fast maybe these uh, creatures could swim? I'm not too sure. I would say the um, ethesaurs that more design like active pursuit predators, they would be able to swim at the same speeds as sharks. As you imagine, like a, uh, like a blue shark chasing after fish, the ethesaurs would be able to swim at that speed. It wouldn't take a lot of effort for them to reach some high speeds to be able to catch fish um, and their prey. So can you talk about how deep they would have been able to dive? So uh, there's been quite a few studies um, done on it, this or deep diving, looking at bones that maybe show signs of like the bends and things like that. I know with Ophthalmosaurus, um, the most conservative estimates is that they could dive up to about 600 meters, um, which is, is a long way down. And that's just like the minimum they could dive. I mean, when you look at like whales today, they can reach ridiculous depths. Um, and there's still a lot of it, uh, stuff about ichthyosaurs we don't know that we haven't looked at. A lot of this stuff is based on like the size of the eye. Um, so a bigger eye means they could dive deeper. Um, but I think there's other factors to include in that. Um, and I, I'm i planning to do some research in the future that may add to that or um, uh, give us some more answers. Um, but yeah, they, some of these souls probably could dive at least 600 meters deep, um, if not deeper. Okay, so is it thought that ichthyosaurs exhibit sexual dimorphism? Not that I'm aware of. I think the only way we know an ichthyosaur is a female ichthyosaur is if we find it with babies inside. Um, there's nothing obvious. Um, well, I know of it might be possible there is sexual dimorphism and it's actually been mistaken for a different species, which is very common in um, paleontology. So it might be that we have male and female, but they're two different species. Um, but yeah, I, there's nothing majorly uh, different with their skeletons that um, that would suggest anything like that. Uh, I had a question about uh, why marine species are found in that particular area where the ichthyosaur was found. Um, it, it's because it's a, it, it's a marine environment. Um, the Kimmeridge clay was, it was a big, big seaway uh, marine. Um, it would have connected to seaways in Russia, down in um, all across Europe. So, and it's a, it's a sort of a deep marine deposit. So in the Jurassic, if you're looking at a deep marine deposit, you're going to expect um, ammonites, belemnites, uh, other rept marine reptiles, fish, things like that. So we haven't found any ichthyosaurs in uh, freshwater systems. So we, if you find an ichthyosaur, you can almost guarantee it's going to be a marine environment. Okay. And uh, since identifying the species that was in the museum, have any other collections identified that same species? Not that I'm aware of. Um, we only described it, it, the paper came out in November or December. So there hasn't been much time um, for people to look through collections and do some comparisons. Um, but I'm really hoping there might be other specimens out there that are the same genus and species, because that'd be really exciting. Be, that would tell us that this thing was actually uh, more widespread than only living in, um, yeah, in Kimmeridge. So. Okay, so I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, call it for today. We're out of time. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Thank you to Ms. Megan Jacobs for joining us today and helping us That's discover right. more about our world. Uh, please join us next Wednesday. We're going to have Dr. Cindy Zhu with us, and she's going to be talking about tail regeneration in reptiles. Uh, now, a lot of people are probably aware that lizards can regrow their tails, but they also found alligators can also do it too. Uh, so this will be tail, tail regeneration in reptiles, lizards, and alligators. Oh my, 
presented by Dr. Cindy Zhu. Uh, so please do join us next week. Uh, you can register for next week's talk at smv.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thank you all very much for coming.